the term policy is often quite hard to define and uh, at one level though it is what the goals and strate uh, strategies of leaders are. In public policy though it's uh, often defined as what a government proposes to do and that could be a high level statement such as getting to net zero by 2050 or it may be the process through which the government is trying to bring those uh, actions about. Typical uh, areas of public policy include how we might raise money, so taxation, and then how we might spend that money. And when you think about social policy, we tend to think about five broad areas. So uh, things such as social security, employment, housing, education and health. Policy may also be a detailed procedure about how something's done, and we've seen that recently with examples of uh, policies and procedures about how you might test people for COVID-19. It's also important to remember that uh, although governments have the ultimate uh, decision-making uh, power uh, and the funding of these policies, there are many other institutions, individuals and agencies that are involved in policy-making and many of these groups have responsibilities to put into to a policy. And so policy is quite a contested term at the moment. So I think of policy making as a set of interrelated practices, and usually I think of it in terms of five key phases. So the first one is about identifying a problem that might need attention. That's followed often by placing the problem on a policymaker's agenda and then trying to develop a set of uh, potential solutions. Fourthly, think about how that policy might be adopted. And finally, we think about how we implement the policy and evaluate how effective it is. Yeah, so at a high level, policy making is important because it commits resources and it commits organisational time around particular problems. And there's always an opportunity cost, so if you spend time and resources on one problem, you can't uh, spend that time again on something else. Poor policy is not only inefficient, but it can lead to bad decisions. So if you think about the policy that the UK government took around mad cow disease, that had poor outcomes. It was not only inefficient, but it was poor policy. We also need to think about uh, how those phases of policy fit together. And it's not just a linear process, but things interact and it's a more dynamic uh, process. Also for researchers, it's not just about producing evidence. Evidence is really important. Identifying a problem or solutions you know, are a key part of policy making, but it's not just a technical exercise. So at its heart policy making is about bringing about change and that may include helping people see that something's a problem, identifying decision makers and generating a willingness to act from those decisions. Think about COVID-19 and the way that evidence led to policy decisions and policy making. Yeah so you know, as a general approach, policymakers need to understand who's going to be impacted by the policy, the potential solutions, their costs and their benefits. So when I think about who's impacted by the issue, that includes not just about knowing the numbers of people affected, something about them and what they would gain from the policy. So either in terms of outcomes, life years gained, reduced mortality. When I think about the potential solutions, policymakers they'll want a range of solutions, particularly including no cost and low cost options. They'll also want to know what the impact of each of those solutions are. As we live in a system that's dominated by economists, these are often drawn together in uh, cost effectiveness or cost benefit analysis to supply a business case. And then increasingly importantly, policymakers will also want a sense of what the public uh, want and whether they will support the actual policy. Well, as a general rule, policies are agreed and implemented within the specific governance that the policymaker operates. So if you think about the national UK budget, that's proposed by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, it's voted on by Parliament and then implemented by the civil service. So what you need to do is understand who the policymaker is and what their decision making process is. And for health, many of those issues will be owned by local health boards or even by local government.
Well, the best policy making is done with a broad group of people from different backgrounds with different perspectives. However, in reality, there's usually a trade-off between involving lots of people and getting the policy making done quickly enough. In health policy, people with lived experience are increasingly used to shape policy, write and even deliver policy. And there are a number of co-production tools that have been developed to help us do that. Depending on the policy, there may even be legal responsibilities to involve certain groups and in the UK to consult with the public on major changes to health services. So research and development projects, they need to provide information, evidence and cost benefits and they should ensure really that they explain what the project will achieve and then what that benefit will be to the population. They need to demonstrate they understand the community and how the service can address those problems and to ensure that the research is addressing a real need that the policy is interested in. They need to make sure that the information is provided in an easy read, easy understandable version as policy makers are, often don't understand all the jargon of some of the research and development uh, uh, work and then ultimately they need to make sure that the benefits to the policy maker are clear. Increasingly policy makers are looking at how that uh, research is transferred, we talk a lot about knowledge transfer and so they're thinking immediately about how that research can be implemented and particularly how that can be implemented locally. Ultimately, uh, research and development projects need to be thinking about how they present the findings that are uh, relevant to solutions and that can provide a policy maker with a range of options to take the next steps. I think the first thing is to see communication and trust building as a key task of researchers. Uh, it's not something that we should just leave to right at the end of the process. So we need to make sure that we're building communication and dissemination right into our projects right at the start and we need to maximise communication throughout. Some of the ways that we can do that are by engaging at a personal level with policy makers and people likely to implement our research. We also need to recognise the role of individual leadership and relationships in dissemination and we need strong people with good personal relationships to help influence uh, policy makers for us and with us. We can engage as early as possible in the process and that's really helpful in terms of testing out key messages as they arise through the research rather than waiting right till the end of the, the research itself. It's always good to build your networks and to maintain and keep networks and keep sharing what you're learning and get feedback on that from other people. Communication, like many other elements of research, is a team effort and you shouldn't just be relying on yourself to do that. The final thing is to always think about this as a long game. If at first you don't succeed, it's worth try, try, try again. Well, in recent years, most national governments have taken an approach to try and professionalise policy making. And uh, to support that, they've often developed a number of tools, techniques or spaces. And uh, in the UK, for example, the Cabinet Office has taken a lead on producing a set of tools around open policy making. One way to think about this is formal learning and informal learning or facilitation. And uh, formal processes include commissions or inquiries. So uh, things like a commission following the Grenfell Tower fire at a national level, but also locally commissions can uh, happen. One such commission would be in, uh, like we've had in Doncaster around uh, the challenge of the climate change. And that enabled us to bring policy makers together to learn and share with the local authority their, their research and their um, potential solutions. For research projects such as Longer Tools, we clearly need to identify a policy dimension in that work and to take both a formal and an informal uh, approach. That informal approach is usually based on researchers reaching out to local policy makers or, or other interested policy makers to start a discussion and a dialogue.
Well, there are a number of reasons. The first one is that we know that individual patients who are involved in clinical trials tend to get better health care and that clinical teams who are providing research um, trials tend to provide better care. So all in all, if you're involved in research, you tend to provide better care and you get better health outcomes. There's often a real synergy as well between that in terms of places that have got research happening have much better health in general. From a professional perspective, often uh, being involved in research is incredibly rewarding. So from that perspective, it's great to be involved in research. One particular challenge I find though is that the population I look after in Doncaster, very few of those are involved in research. A lot of the research in the UK happens to happen in what's called the Golden Triangle between London, Oxford and Cambridge and uh, on a very limited range of healthcare conditions. So part of my job is to bring research to Doncaster to widen the number of people that can be involved in research but also to widen the, the uh, types of trials that people can have. So I need to understand the outputs of research so that I can better influence uh, resourcing locally but also to improve the health of my population. Well I think increasingly research is more than just a researcher wanting to test a hypothesis and looking for a group of people or a population to involve. Ultimately, researchers are public servants, and this is about a partnership between researchers and a population. So uh, I think it's really important that communities are involved in research, helping design the questions, but also being able to see the impacts of the research and how that's made changes to policy for them. I think we've also seen a shift from single condition research to thinking about multiple morbidity or people with multiple conditions. And as those um, health issues are generally uh, driven by the places we live, work and play. It's really important that we use the community as the focus of our research and not just individual people. This does mean that some of our research methods are um, maybe more effective than others and although in recent years we've seen a, an increase in randomised controlled trials for drug studies, particularly for some of the work that we're interested in and these long-term impacts of risk factors over people's life course, uh, things like cohort studies are really important. They're good because they're cheaper to run than randomised control trials, but also they allow uh, the community to get involved in terms of the research questions of today, but also the research questions of uh, tomorrow. That's why places like Doncaster are interested in generating and enrolling their own cohorts so that they can work with researchers to test the hypotheses and to understand the impacts that are happening locally. Mm -hmm.